Hello, hello, yay, what's up? It's time for the 8020 of sound design. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm joined today by Kilrune, AKA Wes, who has uh, made the mission to the dojo to come study with me. So uh, welcome Wes. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, good to have you. Um, cool, so today we are covering the 8020 of sound design. And uh, this is a class all about the things that I use every day that I wish I knew at the beginning. Because sound design, when you're first getting into music making, can really seem like this endless rabbit hole of super technical, super hard to understand stuff. And when you are looking at like ads, and other marketing materials, they're always like, hey, sound design is hard. You need to be like a super expert who went to some fancy accredited institution and got a diploma in sound design to even attempt this. But with the sounds in this preset pack, if you just buy this, you'll have a hit record in like two seconds, right? And so we're, you know, always bombarded again and again and again with like, hey, this is hard. Leave the sound design to the pros, you know, like the fun part is just playing MIDI or whatever. And that's all lies. It's lies. You can get to know what you need to know actually pretty quick and easy. And sound design is really fun. And, you know, when you understand what to do, but more importantly, what not to do and what not to worry about, sound design can become a very fun and creative part of your workflow. And when I show you some of the stuff that I'm going to show you today, you will realize that if you have never included sound design in your workflow, you're missing out because... A lot of the best electronic music is very simple compositionally, you know, and it's the sound design that enables that simplicity to work. See, electronic music is like a three way dynamic where you have like mixing, composition and sound design coming together. That is production. And if you ignore any one of those three aspects, you will not be a complete producer. So, um, you know, when you're learning, you have to learn everything all at once, which is kind of a daunting task. But the way I like to break it down is like the most important skill to learn is how to finish something, how to sit down, have an idea, make it good enough to call it done and move on. Because if you don't finish things, you're just training yourself to give up halfway through. And there's like whole other workshops that I've done about this and about why it's important to finish things and to learn finishing first before you make the process complicated for yourself. But once you've learned how to finish something, um, you're inevitably going to want to be a complete producer. And uh, to be a complete producer, you must focus on mixing, composition, and sound design, you know, more or less equally until you're at like a passable level in all three. And then you can specialize and work on leveraging your strengths rather than filling in your weaknesses, right? But a lot of the best music, a lot of the best electronic music is made by people who didn't really know, know what they were doing. And there are many times when I will talk to someone whose music I like listened to and was just like, wow, this person is on another level. They're so good. And then I actually get down and talk to them and I'm like, oh, they don't really actually have a very deep knowledge of music production. They just know what works for them. And that's fine. You know, a lot of the time, like uh, I remember when I was doing a remix for G Jones and Minnesota and I needed some, some MIDI from some of the parts and they sent me their project file. And a lot of their, a lot of their channels were just like, you know, massive with like one EQ on it. And that's it. Like there was all kinds of stuff that they were just like, 
you know, barely touching or not doing, but the track as a whole came together beautifully and sounded great. Right. And that's, that's ultimately what the big, the big most important thing is, is that, that it sounds great and has an emotional impact on, on the listener and you don't need to know everything. So I'm going to tell you not just what you should focus on and should understand, but also what are some of the things that you can set aside and not worry about? Because there's a lot of things that you feel like you should do when you watch a bunch of YouTube tutorials. For example, you know, if you want to have space for your sub bass, you should put a high pass on every channel. You know, if you want to um, avoid your music sounding like doggy doo doo, you should avoid clipping. Right. If you want things to be loud, you should put a compressor on every channel. Right. But I have learned over time that all of these things that uh, you should do it, are actually you shouldn't. And often the thing you should do is the exact opposite of the conventional wisdom. And many of my biggest breakthroughs as a music producer have been doing the exact opposite thing from the thing that everyone tells you to do. So, um, you know, if you want more on uh, mixing, you should check out my course, Composing the Mix, where we talk about the, um, the three-way relationship of mixing, composition, and sound design as well. Uh, that, and if you want more on, like, getting over your mental blocks, you should check out my course, The Breakthrough. And if you want more about organizing uh, your workflow for maximum productivity, making templates, etc., you should check out my course, The Workflow. But today's course is the 80-20 of sound design. It's all about focusing on the magic 20% of sound design knowledge that will take you 80% of the way to the mountaintop. Okay, so the 80-20, uh, a.k.a. Pareto's principle, P-A-R-E-T-O, Pareto's principle um, was created by an economist named Pareto who liked to grow pea plants. And Pareto found that, you know, no matter how he interbred the plants, no matter how many generations of just breeding the top producing pea plants with the top producing pea plants, no matter what he did, the breeding could increase the overall yield, but in every crop, there were 20% of the pea plants that were producing 80% of the pea yield. And that this principle uh, held true, um, not just for pea plants, but for any organic distribution. There is an 80-20 of pea plants. There is an 80-20 of cleaning your house. There is an 80-20 of songwriting. There's uh, an 80-20 of everything. So when you're trying to figure out what you can do at any one time that can be the most effective, always be asking yourself, what is the 80-20? And when I talk to producers who are, you know, a lot of the time they're producers who are not the most technical producers. They haven't memorized every single detail about like, you know, how digital audio works or what compressor circuits do what or whatever. They may not have memorized all that stuff, but they're making hit records. And that's what matters. OK, is making records that people get a kick out of. You know, no matter what it is that that you're focusing on technically, it is always with the goal of making records that people love, making records that, you know, maybe not everybody loves, but the people that do love them are ride or die for those records. You know, uh, it's not about making everybody like you. It's about making the people that like you like you a lot. OK, and um a lot of the sound design stuff that I'm going to show you here is about breaking the rules and it's about getting weird because properly understood the history of sound design is a history of people breaking the rules and getting weird because guess what? People who like music like weird music. That's how it is. Okay. 
the people who, you know, like, sure, like stuff like Justin Bieber and Katy Perry might be the most numerically popular music and might get the most plays. But you know why? It's because that music is designed to be palatable to people who are not music heads. OK, the people who listen to Katy Perry and stuff all day, they don't dig for records. They don't particularly care. They're just like, hey, this is this is the biggest, most popular stuff. And they like it because it's the biggest and most popular. There are some people who, you know, like I know a lot of mixing engineers who are really geeked out on pop music because that's where a lot of the best mixing engineers do their stuff. It's like it's like enjoying the the Transformers movie for the special effects. Nobody watches a Michael Bay movie because he's a good storyteller. <laughs> or or because of the 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 rich nuanced portrayals of female characters nobody watches michael bay movies because of that they watch it because it's a flex they want to see they want to see the crazy sound design and the giant cgi robots and and uh, because it's a blockbuster right but people who are actually into film don't watch michael bay movies people who are actually into music don't listen to justin bieber or katy perry okay so a lot of this is about getting weird, but that's a good time. So let's get weird. Uh, but before we get weird, I want to cover some stuff that is just going to make your life way freaking easier. Okay. So we're going to start with some of the stuff to not focus on. All right. So um, I'm going to start this out with a little demo I call YEQ is ruining your shit <laughs> right so this is very important i'm gonna get an operator here uh wait, operator is just a very basic uh fm synthesizer in ableton it can also do additive synthesis which is pretty cool and i'm gonna go get the um m oh sorry m oscilloscope okay so m oscilloscope or the melda oscilloscope is a device that is from melda productions it is free along with the best distortion plugin ever so you go to meldaproduction.com and if you go to the bundles and you go to the free bundle you can get a whole bunch of incredible free plugins that I love so dearly. My favorite distortion ever, my favorite oscilloscope ever. And you can see they've quoted me here and Mr. Bill on here. We, we, we geek out on these because they're great. So get this free bundle. Um, we're going to go into M Wave Shaper later. Get this free bundle. Melda Production is very cool. Uh, a lot of people don't like them because of the GUI. You know, their, their GUIs are admittedly not the prettiest but they really do sound great and that's the most important thing it's very important to kind of decouple what things look like from what they sound like so um i've set this operator to make a saw wave and i've set this oscilloscope to normalize said saw wave so we can have a look at it and uh let's that it's almost a saw wave there's this little spike at the beginning because it's made by adding sine waves together just like every other wave um but okay so we've got a saw wave and it's showing up on the oscilloscope so now i'm gonna get an eq out here and i'm gonna turn all the poles off and we're gonna look at this eq and we can see if we look at the eq you can see that there's a fundamental frequency at around 133 hertz and uh, that there's some kind of like low level noise maybe below 100 but not, not much going on just at the beginning there's a little click right so you can see there's that little click so um, let's say where we're going to make a song with a sub and we want to clear up this low area just in case anything comes through we want to make sure that it's not there so it's not hitting the sub, right? So what are we going to do? We're going to put a high pass on it and we're going to bring that high pass up to say 100 hertz. So now our fundamental frequency here is above 100 hertz. It's at 130 hertz. So high passing it at 100 hertz should do nothing to the sound wave, right? Shouldn't, shouldn't do anything to the sound wave. It should, should just, you know, there's nothing down there. So why would it make a difference, right? Watch what happens to this sound wave when I slowly start creeping this high pass up. What's going 
going on? Why is it adding this funky sine wave in there? Well, that's because how EQ works is the same way noise canceling headphones work, right? When you um, use noise canceling headphones, what they're doing is there's a microphone that's listening to sounds in the world and it is creating the exact opposite waveform to cancel that wave out. That's how an EQ circuit works in analog hardware and it's how a digital EQ works. It is not merely turning down these frequencies. How is it turning down these frequencies? It's turning it down by introducing the opposite wave. And that's what we're seeing here. And this opposite wave is starting to knock everything out of phase. Without that opposite wave, if I take this EQ off, you can see, well, you can see that, that you know it's got a nice, clear, sharp beginning on the wave. And when I add this in, it's like changing the changing the the way that that wave actually is it's no longer a saw wave so this is happening whenever you high pass anything and it is affecting the fidelity of your audio it is affecting the transient response especially because the transient response depends on all of the frequencies in your sound being lined up so that when they all hit they all hit at the exact same time well when you're introducing these funky extra um, sine waves to, to, to fill in the sub to create the subtract from the sub it's knocking that transient out of phase with itself and the different portions of that transient wave are the different portions of the wave composing the transient are not going to be hitting at the same time and things start sounding less and less physical they start sounding more and more fake and they kind of start falling apart so don't just put EQs on because you think you should. Put them on because there's a definitely a problem that you need to solve, right? So when do you do what when you're producing music? You, you do it when you are identifying a problem that can be solved, right? Your mix, you want your mix to have focus. You want there to be uh, something that sits in the front and, and the spotlight you know like a singer and then you want the rest of the sounds to be working as a unit filling everything up while trying to avoid drawing attention uh, acting like a band so if you for the for each sound you need to ask does this sound need to stand out or blend in if it needs to stand out turn it up if it needs to blend in turn it down then if that's not enough, ask yourself, does an aspect of the sound need to stand out or blend in? If it's the transients, you treat the transients. If it's the um, frequencies, you treat the frequencies. If it is the width, you treat the width. If it's et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then and only then should you use EQs uh, and compression and all that. Because you can mix your music, make it sound great, with just volume, just by adjusting the volume, you can make things sound great. So I'm going to show you this. This is um, uh, a mix that I got. There's this website. If you look up stems for mixing practice, you can go to this website here um, where there is, wait a minute, that's not the right one. Stems for mixing practice. Yes, this Cambridge one. Uh, and in this Cambridge archive, there is a ton of, let's see, where is it? Where is the library search page? There we go. I'll paste this into the chat. Um, and you can go here and get tons of stems from different bands, different electronic music, etc. cetera. Uh, some of them, they'll have like hundreds of stems per song. Uh, you know, like uh, some of them are just like a couple dozen. Some of them are like two. But you can get these stems and you can practice mixing on other people's music. I highly recommend this because you can be much more objective when you're working on other people's music. So I went and I got some stems for mixing practice um, from a band uh, called, I think, Juliet's Rescue. And this is what they sound like. So you can hear there's the guitars are in front of the vocals, right? There's the drums aren't hitting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now the temptation 
would be to say, oh, well, let's EQ out the guitar frequencies from the vocal. Let's, um, you know, let's boost up the sub on the drums, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what I did in this particular episode of the weekly download is I went and mixed this whole track using nothing but gain staging. Okay. And gain staging refers to setting the relative levels of the tracks in your song. I don't know why that's not going. Yeah, there we go. Um, so what I did was I went in and I set the volume faders for each of these channels. If you look at the channels, there's almost nothing on them. There's this subgroup that I made to isolate the sub bass because this thing didn't have sub bass, but that's the most complicated piece of routing in the whole thing. The rest of it, there's nothing on any of these channels. There's nothing uh, except for a little bit of EQ on some of the channels, but they all pretty much are just empty channels. There is, um, yeah, there's like a couple things, like this song did not have bass. So to give it to have bass, I isolated just the sub there. And then in the bass, uh, I made this routing channel where I was isolating just the sub in the, the routing. Um, but that's it. Those are the only things that I did was just isolate the sub out with some EQ. Um, but the rest of the channels, there's nothing on them. There's nothing on them. They've just had their volume faders set to the right level. And then each group of sounds, right? Like uh, the you know drum group, for example, has digital clipping. Look at that. This is a clipper. It's a free device that you can get called G Clip. And this G Clip device has hard digital clipping the exact thing they tell you to not do it offers that you can specify a level and the sound waves cannot go past that level it cuts the peaks off anything past that is just a flat line so how am i getting away with this clipping right well what's happening is this clipper like if we go to my kick group you can see that this clipper is not clipping all the time it's just clipping the tiny peaks off right like here i'll zoom in Right, you can see the actual amount of clipping is just tiny. It's just this tiny, tiny amount of clipping that just takes off like these tiny little two millisecond to five millisecond uh, peaks, right? And when you get those peaks out, most of the time that's all the dynamic control you need is to kill the, the peaks, to stop the peaks from adding up because the peaks adding up create big spikes that overwhelm your limiter. So all I did was I, I used clippers on some of these channels and I used limiters on other channels because something like a guitar, because uh, a guitar is going to cross the threshold and stay there. You know, it's going to sustain on the other side of the threshold, not like a clipper. Clipper just cuts everything off past the peak, but a um, uh, 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 guitar, it's just not the right shape. A bass is not the right shape. So I use like limiters and stuff on some of the channels, but there's always either a clipper or a limiter on all these channels that's just, you know, cutting things off. And then my groups go into these groups that also have more clipping or limiting, a little bit of side chaining, and that's it. So by doing pretty much nothing except for volume, uh, like by not doing any EQ, not doing any compression, like there's admittedly a couple of these things because I think like in a later save, I dipped these out to make room for the vocal. And I think in this one, oh no, I didn't do it. Yeah, I, I had Nectar, but I turned it off so that this could still be, still be a demo of just gain staging. So for with nothing but gain staging, using clipping, the thing you're not supposed to do, no high pass, no compressors, nothing but gain staging and isolating the bass, um, I was able to turn this into this. So this section sounds like this. And now this. Everything's blurry like it's meant to be. We're all Just setting the volumes to the right level. That's it. That's it. You don't need all that EQ. You don't. You don't need all that EQ. You really don't. Stop putting fucking high passes on everything. EQ is ruining your shit. Clipping isn't bad. 
Okay? Clipping isn't bad. EQ is ruining your shit. It's what you need to know. All right. So now um, let's go back to my list of things we're going to talk. Okay. So gain staging, clipping. Yeah. Here, I'll just open up um, the... I'll, yeah. Let's talk about clipping a little bit because clipping is a really, really important tool. Um, so let's get a drum break here. Just grab a random drum break. Okay, so let's get a drum break. And then I'm going to get a kick and a snare. Let's get a kick. Oh, i got to change my BPM. Okay, so I'm putting these kicks on top of the kicks. Actually, no, I'll just do the first half of this. So let's say we got that. And let's say we get a snare. Let's get like an 808 snare. Put it under the... Okay, let's say we wanted that snare under the snares. And let's get a hat. So this is often a... Uh, let's see, closed hat. So this is often a situation that people will will find themselves in where they'll have a drum break and then some other stuff, uh, other drum pieces on top of it, right? Um, so let's see, let's do that. And yeah, I'm leaving the fades on these. I know that I've left the fades on. Don't, don't forget about it. Okay, so let's see. I like got some hats where the hats go. We've got some kicks and some snares where the kicks and snares go. And there we go. Okay, so now. Okay, so that sounds pretty good, right? So let's group these together and call this all drums. And now I want to take a sample of this. So I'm going to sample from all drums. And I'm going to sample just the break so you can see what that looks like. Okay, so we got a nice level there. Uh, I'm going to put minus six here. Just do that again because uh, we need to be able to have headroom. Okay, great. So I'm going to duplicate that. And now I'm going to add the rest of those sounds in there. And we'll see what happens. All right, so we can see here that this has added like a lot of peaking to these sounds. Like these are no longer nearly as even in volume. And there's a lot of like a lot of funky peaks that are kind of randomly happening. Um, I think this might be easier to show if I get like, a, let's, get, let's get a bass loop. Okay, so let's get this bass loop here. Um, and then let's get a guitar loop. get this guitar loop and then if you take the two of these i'll just put these on those same channels because there's not really anything on them and you look at what they look like together oh wait let's do that okay so here there we go now you can see what i'm talking about so even though there's not like these are not like peaky sounds like there's not big peaks here and there's not big peaks here, but when they're summing, you get a lot of these like tiny little random peaks, like right here. There's no transient in either of those sounds at that moment. But just by a quirk of the way the waves line up, 
there's a little peak here that's much louder than everything, a little peak here that's much louder than everything, a little peak here that's much louder than everything. And when I scroll over and like, look how long these peaks are, that's not even one millisecond, right? Like you see how I moused over and then you can see at the bottom left, it shows you the time. So you can see that that peak is like not even one millisecond, but that's like a big difference. Or here, like see here, what's this? This peak is so much louder than everything else. There's no... Like, it's crazy. You get these like random, like tiny little peaks, right? Uh, and then, you know, it happens in drum beats like this, like this kick. If you look at this kick here, right? Oh, come on, make it big, make it big. There we go. Yeah, if you look at this kick here, this is like way quieter than this, but this is like super, super peaky, right? Like this guy does not have a peak in, in it. You know, it's a fairly flat dynamic. This kick, same thing. It's like fairly flat, but just the way those happen to line up in that moment. And like this other time, it doesn't line up. You know, we get a peak coming at the bottom, right? So you get these like funny, weird moments of peaking that happen that are just from the quirk of the way that the waves sum right and um if you put like a compressor let's say we try and get rid of those with the compressor so i'll get the ableton compressor all right if we try and get rid of those with the compressor i'll bring down the threshold and i'll turn the ratio really high and then the attack and release down and then we'll see what 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 that sounds like see here it's going there's this kind of like swishy swishy noise that happens that is like the the kind of coloration that's happening from the compressor as it's dipping and stuff and you'll see that it's not actually that effective at taking those peaks off right like you can see it's it's kind of like made a uh, uh you know made the transients more pronounced in this one like the wave isn't as fat but it hasn't really taken those peaks off at all. If anything, they're worse. Like, look at this one, you know, cause that's that tiny little initial time that it takes the compressor to start. So we get these like big spikes, right? And that's what the compressor like, all, let's take the attack all the way down, take the release all the way down and infinity. This should be a brick wall cutting off peaks, right? But it's not, look what it actually does. Right? Like, I'm not seeing any flat top on here. And there's still is tons of these tiny little peaks that are going to be a problem in summing. Right? So let's try a limiter then. All right? Maybe the limiter is the right tool for the job here. So let's get a limiter out um, and get the Ableton limiter. I'll do a ceiling minus six, I guess. Okay, so it's still making that kind of like swishy noise, but it kind of like, it's like farting out a little bit. Like it's going like. <laughs> right, so now we're getting the flat top that we want on the dynamics, but it's really, it's audibly very distorted. Like this is kind of like wrecking our sound. So we could, I suppose, open up the limiter a little bit to maybe like, I don't know, minus three. Let's see what that, see if that's less distorted sounding. Right? It's a little bit better, so I'll save this as limiter. Um, but I want to see what the same thing, had, like what the same thing is like with Clipper. So I'm going to use a G, a G clip. My favorite is standard clip, but it's a paid plugin. Um, so I'm just going to use G clip here and let's put G clip on and set the threshold on G clip to minus three. So 50 is minus six. So I think minus three will be 75. I'm pretty sure that's how that works. Um, and now let's listen to it. Right? So digital clipping sounds bad. Never use digital clipping. It's never transparent. It sounds like garbage. If you clip a digital device, you're an idiot, right? No, actually completely fucking wrong. 
Here is taking the peaks off of the limiter. And here is taking the peaks off a of G-clip. Listen to the transient response. Listen to the highs, right? In the limiter version, the transients, that sharp clicky click on the transients is all mushy and lost. And it's the highs are muffled and it's getting that small feeling. It's losing its openness. It's losing its fidelity. It's losing its uh, three-dimensional feeling. It's losing its physicality, right? And it's getting muffled and no transients. So limiter. Clipper. No competition, man. So clipping on things with short, tiny little peaks, which occur in drum sounds and in summing, clipping is more transparent than limiting. Harsh, digital clipping, the thing they tell you not to do <laughs> is much more transparent than limiting. Right. And this is true even with the nicest limiters. Like we can do this with, uh, let's do um, Pro L2, right? Really expensive limiter, totally nice. It's my favorite limiter. I use it all the time. Whenever I'm using channels where it requires a limiter, I will use this. So let's, let's bring this up um, and then we'll see. Okay. So we want this to be, I think, minus three. Okay. And now um, I will record that to this channel. Oh, wait, that was our clipping one here. I'll duplicate that. This was clipping. And this one will be the Pro L one. So that so we don't get crazy flanging. So you can see Pro L is definitely better than the Ableton limiter by a lot, right? This is Pro L. And then this is clipping. See, Pro L is still digging the transient response down. Um, now I can see that maybe maybe we could use a little bit of gain here, this minus three. So I'll put plus three up here. That's trying to provide a three ceiling. So I think that that'll actually probably be more accurate if I do it like that. Oopsie. Saw that. Okay, that's a better level. So this is Pro L. And this is clipping. Like it's harder to tell, but the transients, you can still hear a difference. Especially on the kick transient. And the highs are noticeably more boxed in and noticeably smaller sounding. Okay. Um, here, I guess I'll save this project file somewhere. Um, let's see, let's go to, I'll just put in the weekly download, I guess. Um, so 80, 20 clipping demo is what I'll call that. Okay. Um, but yeah, so it's, um, it definitely is a pretty big difference. All right. So I'll show you something else that is super duper cool. Um, and this is my favorite distortion plugin, which is M wave shaper. So I'm going to get a, um, I'm going to get a sub here. Let's go. Um, let's get battle of the subs. Um, so this is a, a sampler instrument that I've made that has subs from all of the synths that I like to use. It's got subs from all the synths that I could use because so, I could show, see which sub is the best because you think a sine wave is a sine wave, but they're not. Every sine wave is different. Every saw wave is different. Every square wave is different. Every synth is different. Okay, so um, I'm going to get some OTT, which is, uh, we should, you should totally 
learn know about OTT. OTT stands for over the top compression. Uh, it's a multi band compressor that became very famous uh, that spawned the OTT plugin, which is free from X for Records. Uh, you should definitely get it. So here's the free OTT plugin. Oh, wait, no, where is it? OTT. Um, yeah, here we are. Products, or maybe it's in the free ones. Oh yeah, here we are. Here's OTT. So you can get a plugin that does it. Um, this one has less phasing issues than the Ableton OTT, just FYI. Um, but um, this is basically a multiband compressor. Everything below these three thresholds gets pushed up. Everything above these gets pushed down. So that means that the sound can only exist in a very narrow place in between each of those thresholds. So if there's any highs at all, they're going to get pushed up and made to be loud. And that's why people use this lot is because it makes things brighter right so um let's go okay so we get a sub i'm going to turn this up a bit uh turn the ott off so there's a sub bass um that is the harmonic engine in pigments this is the analog engine the wavetable engine you can see they all sound pretty similar as you go through them right but when you put ott on them it's going to reveal all the kind of low level character that is normally too quiet to hear in these sounds so let's see what the what these different waves sound like Ooh. Here's that like low level kind of high noise. And if you make a triple OTT, you can really hear it. Now the analog sub. Notice that the analog sub has some noise in it that is from the fact that it was recorded through a preamp it's got this low level of noise in it and that noise is going to be like covering up those digital artifacts that you would normally get in um that you'd normally get when you really blast a a, a sound wave you know all these digital synths they have this like crazy oh, there's aliasing You can hear that? How that one? It's like this note. That note and that note. The math, it just lines up wrong. So you get aliasing. And that's even when it's on the best interpolation. So not every so uh, sound wave is created equal. I like to use sounds that came through a preamp because uh, they have that low level noise. And then when you start blasting it with extreme processing, that noise will kind of act like dithering and cover up some of the distortion. Right, I, I, I like that. Um, but yeah, so let's, uh, let's um, make something out of this uh, analog wave. So I'm gonna go sisters sub, and I'm gonna get this sub bass that I've made. And this is a sub bass that I made. It's a multi, or just a sample where I went and sampled um, one of my favorite hardware filters feeding back. And I have like, um, let's take this pitch envelope down. And then I will sometimes um, put FM on this or whatever to thicken it up. But it's a nice thick analog sub. It sounds really juicy. It rocks hard on a PA. Um, and I want to show you uh, a couple different things about the different flavors of distortion. But I'm going to start with the Ableton Saturator. Okay, so when you want a sound to have more highs or more presence and you don't want to use EQ, Saturator is your number one tool. Okay, so when I turn this Saturator up here, let's get the Spectrum out. And let's look at the Spectrum. And then let's get our Oscilloscope out. And we will look at the Oscilloscope and we'll see what we're dealing with. Okay, so we've got Spectrum and an Oscilloscope. I'll lower the floor on the Spectrum. So you can see there's pretty much just one frequency coming in here. There's a little bit of harmonics, but not much, right? As we turn up the saturator, we're going to get odd band harmonics coming in. And you 
can see that wave is turning more and more into a square wave as I turn it up. And it moves a lot like this dark area on the oscilloscope that that represents where the wave is away from the back of the speaker. So whether it's pushing out or sucking in and then this middle line represents where the, the sound wave is stable. So you want that speaker cone to be spending as much time away from its resting point as possible to move as much air as possible. So, you know, this dark area, that dark area getting filled up is is good that's what we like that's that's thickening it up and making the sound fat um but uh gain in electronic music is quite literally a zero-sum game for one thing to be loud other things must be turned down so to illustrate that i will show you with operator here and then i'm going to go get the spectrum out again and I'm going to get the limiter out here and we're going to go into additive synth mode. So this is where I'm adding sine waves at different frequencies. And you'll see what happens to the sound wave when I start. So we have one frequency. Oh, let's go down. And I'll open that up and we'll crush that hard into the limiter. Right. So you can see that that one frequency is as loud as Ableton can make it. What happens when I start adding other frequencies here? Watch. As that one comes up, that one comes down. Look. So you can see as each one of these is added, it's taking away power from the main frequency and that's the same thing if i smash it into like distortion or whatever too like if i put on the shaper here you see as those other ones hit the limiter they're pulling down the fundamental one Of these other frequencies there are the less of that one there is here i just gotta adjust the scale right like you see here even like as i turn it off you can see them like you know it's taking them down all right here let's But yeah, so um, it's a zero-sum game. For one thing to be loud, other things need to make room. That's the same thing when you're mixing and the same thing when you're sound designing. So although this wave, when it's squared off, right? Although this wave you would think is the loudest wave, in actual reality, um, Having a sine wave that is concentrated at one frequency gives you all of the gain of the sound system on that one frequency. So when you're making your bass sounds, it pays to have an oscilloscope and kind of look at the wave to be able to make sure that it's gotten lots of this nice dark area um, where the wave is away from, from rest. And that when you start adding crazy high frequencies, you're not taking away too much from that dark area. So watch what happens when we use one of these like funky, um, funkier kind of distortion types. Right? So this, it still seems like it's as loud as it can be because it's going to this clipper here. When you turn on soft clipping on the distortion, that means it can't exceed a certain level. But you can see that this, la this type of distortion, it's carving away a lot of the dark area that um, we need to move air. Like when we get there, that's kind of more like a square wave and it has a little bit more dark, but you see that that type of uh, wave folding, this digital clip is still lots of dark area, um, but like some of these wave shaper ones, You know, you can see that they, they, you really have to push them hard before it stops taking away. Like that is 
going to be quieter than a sine wave, but this is going to be louder because there's more dark area on the oscilloscope. So when you're making bass sounds, you want to make sure that they've got that strong fundamental frequency. The other um, harmonics in the wave are not going to be taking away from that frequency because um, the more harmonics there are, the less loud any one of them can be, especially the fundamental. So you can see here when I was changing these different types, you can see that this graph in the middle was changing, right? What does this graph represent? Well, this is a transfer curve, right? This is saying volume in to volume out. If it was entirely linear left to right, it would be, um, you know, it would not be distorting, but the non-linearity of this transfer curve is where you get distortion. And um, there's nothing better for that then M Wave Shaper from Melda Production. So M Wave Shaper is a distortion that allows you to draw your own transfer curve and it's free. And this means that you can make your own custom distortions that sound super duper cool. So I'm gonna put this on and then make this, this is like typical of a saturator type of distortion. And you can see that's making it more square as I turn up the input gain. Right, so that sounds a lot like the Ableton saturator, right? That's sort of a transfer curve. Um, if I wanted to make a wave folder type of transfer curve, I could go to signs like this and then drag this up. And now we get a graph that is like the wave folder on the Ableton saturator. You can see here, if I put this to uh, sinoid fold, you'll see it's making sine waves. So this would be, that's what the sinoid fold looks like in Ableton. So. Um, so that's what the sinoid full looks like. If you wanted to be kind of like a lo-fi sort of effect, you could go to stairs and then draw some stairs because this is essentially reducing this full, um, full potential of this whole, all these values to actually, it can only be like three or four values. So we go to eight stairs. That's now an eight bit wave. Look at it. And you see how those hard edges are adding to the highs. That's a great way to add highs without taking away from the black area, right? So get the oscilloscope out and see what all of the different types of distortion do. But you'll find that the M Wave Shaper plugin can emulate a lot of the types of distortion effects that you get in other devices. Uh, one thing that it's not excellent at is amp emulation. Amp is... Um, modeling a guitar amp and uh, the the behavior is modeled after actual analog circuits. I love amp. Like look at these wave types. But you can really see what these what these different transfer curves are like when you have the oscilloscope out. So amp is a little bit different, um, overdrive is different, but get used to using an oscilloscope to see what your distortions are doing and get to know the different flavors of distortion. Because I, I think honestly, getting to know the flavor of distortions, all the different flavors of distortions, what they do, what they can be used for, I would rate that as more important than EQ and compression. Right. So M Wave Shaper, you can use it as a clipper. You can use it as a saturator. You can use it as a bit reduction. You can use it as a folder, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'm just going to clear the points again. I'm going to show you one last thing that I like to do. Let's just go back to mode one. And uh, one thing that I like to do that is is pretty cool is this. This transfer curve can do stuff like this. You may have recognized these transfer curves from like a compressor. Like, let's say I wanted to compress it. If I made a transfer curve like this, 
it would be essentially acting like a compressor. Like if we take the Ableton compressor out and we have a look at it in this view, that's what this is. It's a transfer curve. You know, if I take the knee down and give that a hard knee, Look at that, we've got a transfer curve. That's exactly the same thing as this is doing. And that's why a lot of compressors and distortions are the same, right? But what this is doing has an attack time and a release time. This has no attack and release time. So yeah, you can get saturation style distortions out of a compressor, but um, a wave shaper, because the wave shaper is instantaneous i can affect this portion of the wave where it's going to the zero crossing a compressor can only get the high and low portions of a wave but a wave shaper or other non-linear distortion type thing can get these areas next to the waveform and you can get a lot of high end out of your sound wave by kind of like drawing some little squiggles down in the corner right oh, let's turn this on like that, you see how this is transferring to that? Like that is a fat sounding distortion. There's lots of black area in the in the waveform, and because I'm I'm focusing on this bottom left area of the sound wave, um, that I can add highs. So then this way I'm keeping this area black so that there's lots of black on the high and low portions of the oscilloscope, and I'm making my bass fat like that. And then the beautiful beauty of this, all of these types of bass, is that changing the gain in changes their behavior check it out so a volume lfo becomes a tone shaping lfo Right? The traditional approach to making a wub is that you would LFO the filter, but LFOing the volume into clipping or LFOing the volume into wave shaping is like way more effective because you don't have the phasing issues that are associated with filters. And, um, uh, you know, you get like really crazy high fidelity physical sounding tones. So yeah, very, very cool. Um, so that's a little bit about clipping um, and about you know why you'd want to use analog sounds. So I'm gonna go now and I'm gonna get this, uh, I'm gonna open up this project file here. Um, this, this beat I just made for one of my students when he was over. And I was just making this as like a quick little demo to show him how you don't have to worry about lots of things, you know, when you're working, you know, you can just, just hit the gas. You need a riff, a turnaround and a drop. That's it. Really. If you're making bass music, you need a riff, a turnaround and a drop. Um, oh, max bass isn't working. Oh, that's annoying. Um, so if you look at these channels, look, nothing on them. It's like a little bit of reverb on that one. Um, this one has some auto pan. This one, nothing. This one, nothing. Uh, this channel, uh, a little bit of filter and um, OTT. Um, this one, nothing. This one, nothing. This one, a little bit far away, rack, but pretty much nothing. Pretty much nothing, nothing, nothing. And I'm not even doing my busing or anything on here. You know, there's not much going on. Look at this riser, it's got a little bit of auto pan, but there's no EQs, there's no compressors. 
It's not really anything. It's like a low pass filter. So most of these channels have like one rack on them, you know, then on my beat, I got a drum bus plug in. And then on the master, literally just letting it clip. That's it. Just letting it clip. And this took me like half an hour. And when I play this live, people scream. Gang of bad bitches, 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 bitches. no processing almost no processing on any of those sounds you know it's all just leveling it to gain stage it clipping the top off in this case i used a drum bus and on this one i used uh pro l2 i used two pro l2 so i limited it once then side chained it and then limited it again and uh that's it that's it it's not really a whole hell of a lot to it nice to be right. you know um, there's not really a whole hell of a lot to it. And when you're writing tracks, you need a riff, a turnaround, and a drop. That's it. So in this case, the riff was this loop. Turnaround was this sample. Gang of bad bitches, 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 bitches. And uh, then the drop. If you look at what's going on here, a very simple drum beat, right? That's the whole beat. It's literally just a snare. And then the bass is the kick. And that's a part of what makes it so loud is that the bass is the kick. So here I have this ill a um, bass machine that I made. And this is uh, a sampler instrument that I made where I sampled the same analog 808 sound through a whole bunch of different types of distortion. And then I split them on the sample selector. And when you move the sample selector, you get different types of distortion. So. Right. So all I'm doing is just picking which distortion type. There's no additional processing to that sound. It's a sound wave running through distortion you can pick which distortion type with a knob that's all that's doing there's no pitch envelope there's no fm there's not really anything going on in the volume envelope there's no modulators or anything it's just choosing which flavor of distortion you want on the 808 that's all that's doing and then this is running into these two stages of limiting to make sure it's nice and loud. And I'm using limiting and not clipping because it's a bass sound and I didn't want as much harsh highs. And um, then you can see here, there's this Moog one. This is another bass sound, I think. Oh, it's just some, some rippy saw wave pitch envelope noises. But that's, and then, yeah, we've got the splash sound. Right? That has a little bit of bass in it, but that's it. So the beat is literally just this. And then there's this fill that comes in every now and then. Right, here's another little fill. And then there's this hi-hat that happens. But I was trying to write this, this was like, like I would search something and I would grab literally the first sample that came up. And this is how that drop sounds. Gang of bad bitches, 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 bitches. Ah! 
There's nothing but a snare. It's all there. It's just a snare. That's the whole beat. It's just a snare. Right? And stuff like that, because remember, it's a a zero-sum game, quite literally, with gain. So the more shit you have, the less loud anything can be. So if you want your sound design to, to shine, way less stuff. Way less stuff. Make the stuff take turns so that one thing happens at a time or as close to one thing at a time as you can. Do your sound design by just layering things. Experiment with distortion flavors before you experiment, before you go ruining everything with EQ. EQ is ruining your shit. Limiters are ruining your shit. Too much compression is ruining your shit. Okay? Just raw ass sounds. Make cool sounds and use them raw. The sounds just have to be cool enough that it's worth using them raw, right? So how do you make sounds that are cool enough to be worth using raw? Well, allow me to show you. So this is one of my favorite sound design tips, and this is actually kind of a recent one for me. So somebody name a type of sound. Pick a drum sound, pick a bass sound, name a type of sound. Whoever's first, I will do that sound. Somebody name a type of sound. Somebody name, ding, 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 ding. Piccolo snare, okay, cool. Let's see if piccolo snare turns anything up. Oh, there's one. Okay, there's my piccolo snare. Okay, great. So this piccolo snare, this is gonna be our sound. And I wanna sound design this piccolo snare and make it super crazy. Right, so I'm gonna go take it like this and I'm gonna give it the loop rooney here so that every half bar we get a new piccolo snare. And I'm just gonna loop it like that up until we get to 64 bars because 64 times two is 128. Now I wanna make this thing increasingly crazy uh, as this thing goes on. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a bunch of different plugins here. So let's do a phaser. And I'm going to crank the feedback on this phaser all the way up. Another thing you're not supposed to do. Okay, cool. Um, now I'm gonna go um, M Wave Shaper, give this thing a little bit of distortion. I should just put warmth up. Actually, that well, warmth it seems to be enough. Yeah, I'm just gonna use Ableton Stock. Okay, so now I'm gonna go an echo, and I'm gonna put some delay on the left and right. I'm gonna take those off sync and make these tiny little delays, make them different on the left and right. Put on ping pong, crank the feedback up. Right? Those are sustaining too much. I don't want that sustain. So I'm gonna take the drum bus plugin, crank it all the way over to the left. I just want the transients. Now I'm going to get a transient designer and crank the transient up at the beginning with the Native Instruments Transient Master here. Okay, cool. Um, now I want to kind of even this out a little. I'm going to use an 1176 compressor because 1176s are fast and we're going to go into compressors in a second. I'm going to use 1176 here. I want to just... Uh in fact, I think I'm going to modulate this. Instead of with that, I'm going to use the Ableton LFO. 
Um, to modulate that phaser because I'm not super happy with the way that cyclical LFO is sounding. I'm going to put that on to that. Put that to like, I guess, half notes. Put this on a random and then randomize the center frequency. That's more what I'm looking for. Okay, cool. That's starting to sound good. Um, now I want to um, mess this up a bit more um, just to make it like kind of cooler. I think I might do some hybrid reverb. Hybrid reverb is quite nice. It's got, the, got this nice um, convolution engine in it that I find myself using a lot. Let's put a hybrid reverb here. Okay, we got a very good sound there. Um, and now I'm going to put standard clip at the end here. Um, just to clip it off at like, uh, let's say minus six. I'll do that with the hard clipping. Just see like those peaks are going to mess up compressors later. Okay, cool. So now we're ready to sample. So I'll call this piccolo snare fucked. Um, and then actually, I think I might get the frequency shifter out here because we want to generate like a whole bunch of wild ass shit. And sometimes frequency shifter can sound quite nice on drums. So I'll put the frequency shifter like there. Let's put it in frequency shifting mode. Right, so you can get quite a few different varieties. Um, and now I'm going to tell this to take from there and I'm going to resample this. Okay, great. So now I'm going to take this recording and I'm going to right click, slice the new MIDI track, and I'm going to slice per half note, slice it to single sampler. Oh, wait, I got to cut the end off because I went a little too long like that. And then I'm going to um, unwarp that and then crop it. Great. Now I'm going to warp it, slice to single sampler. Go to slice the mini track, slice a single sampler, one per half note, slice a single sampler, one shot. This is a slicing preset I made. And now you can see there are 128 different wild ass snares. So if I can, if I leave these like this, I can play them one per note going up the keyboard. But all I like to do is select them all, go like this to make it so that they all take up all the zones, then go here. Double click on root to make them so that they're all C3. Then go to velocity, distribute ranges equally on velocity. And then I can save this as Ill or 128 Ill Piccolo Snare Fucked. And now we have all these different, uh, all these different snares 
And when I go like this and make a pattern, right, the velocity is going to determine what the hit is. Right? So they're they're all Okay, let's make this one. Let's do some, some more. And then you get riffs that sound like this. Automating that kind of shit would take for goddamn ever, right? Um, so I'm going to get my 808 hardware kit out here. This is a kit that I made in the complete collection that is all hardware sounds. Um, they're all velocity sensitive, multi samples. Uh, you can watch me make some more music I'm doing on Thursday, tomorrow at 6 p.m. I'm going to be um, making some stuff using that. Okay, so what are we going to get? Yeah, let's get rid of that. So I'm going to take this piccolo snare and swap it out for this fella. And this is why I did velocity and not the note is so that I can use it inside of a drum rack. So. So you can duplicate that. No. All it takes is like one of those sounds in your drum kit, and your drum kit is a completely different fucking experience. <laughs> and suddenly you have a lead, and suddenly your drum kit feels like a drop, just the drum kit. So you can make 128s really, really easy like that. You just... You know, two bars or 64 bars of half notes, fuck it up and resample it, slice to MIDI, turn them to velocity, boom, right? And then you've got these really expressive uh, playable things, okay? Um, so now, um, let's go uh, and do one last thing. Let's see what else we have on the list. We're running out of time here. Um, yeah, hardware sounds, resampling, flavors of distortion. Yeah, you know what? It is already almost 1.30 and I was supposed to be 90 minutes. Um, okay, uh, I'll show you one last thing here. I'll show you how you can make any sound into a lead. So let's take... Just find like a little nothing hit. That is not... Oh yeah, that perks so as rim shot. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this rim shot into a drop. Because you can make anything into a drop. You can make anything you want into a drop. You just have to treat it the right way. Okay, so this is this will be our drum beat, nice and simple. Okay, so now let's take this rim shot.
Okay, so this is a tiny little nothing sound, you might be thinking. How are you going to make this into a drop? All you need is something to agitate your convolution or whatever. But what we're going to use for this, we're going to use, I want to show you like, because delay, chorus, and reverb are all essentially versions of the same thing. Delay, flanger, chorus, reverb, um, and phaser, they're all essentially versions of the same thing. So if I were to take like the Ableton delay here, let's just get a delay. And I'm going to put it onto ping pong mode. And I'm going to turn these up. And then to feedback up. Do that. Okay, and now I'm going to take a chorus. So we've got a little bit of movement there because those delays are kind of bouncing up and down. Oops, not a corpus. I'm going to take a chorus, which is under chorus. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to group it and take all the major parameters like wet, dry, rate, amount, feedback, polarity, um, I'm going to do the warmth. Okay. And then I'm going to go and put like fucking 10 of them. And then when I manipulate these parameters, it's going to do the same thing on all of them. Actually, I should have mapped the volume out, maybe put a compressor at the end or a clipper because these levels are going to get unruly. So uh, the Ableton devices, there's some clippers in the Ableton devices, notably in the glue compressor. And you can see my default glue compressor. I've taken the range down, thus turning the compression off and got the soft clipping on. So now. Now we're going to once again take away everything except for the, take away those tails, like that. And then let's get another glue compressor here. This time we're going to compress. Much tail. Put this here, actually. Okay, so now if we play our beat without the thing soloed. Yeah, if you want to make this sub a little louder, let's put a little.
Real easy to make anything into a drop with that technique. You just want to add delay, reverb, etc. But take away the tails, so you get like a short sound that has lots of delay and reverb. And then you want to saturate it or compress it and make, break it down to just the transients. And then you know if you were to add like saturator or whatever, you could make it shorter and tighter. Maybe some overdrive. And then if you add in our friend, the piccolo snare. Like you could, you could make that into a drop with just the sounds in the existing drum kit. All it takes is a little bit of sound design, but remember like chorus, delay, reverb, flanger, those are all the same thing, right? And these basic, basic tools are more than enough to make super crazy sounding shit. It's really just about like taking more risks, you know, making the sounds as crazy as you can, then sampling them and chopping them up until you've brought order to chaos. So create chaos, sample it, and then break it down. Uh, you know, you don't need all that EQ and compression. Really, you need like, you know, saturation and gain staging and really make yourself familiar with the different flavors of distortion. All right, so that's probably all we have time for for now. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm pretty stoked about that. I uh, hope you've enjoyed yourself. I'll probably be doing uh, another one of these soon. The weekly download is the best training deal on the internet. For five bucks, you get access to a collection of downloads, tutorials, interviews, templates, sounds, samples, and even psychology and philosophy lectures to cover every conceivable need of a modern music producer. It gets one download better every Wednesday night at seven.